Here's a fairly simple fact. If I gave you two numbers, x and y, and told you that both x is less than or equal to y and y is less than or equal to x, you could immediately conclude that, in fact, x is equal to y. That's the only way for two numbers to both be less than or equal to each other. Today, I'd like to talk about a vast generalization of this fact. Suppose x and y aren't just numbers, but infinite sets, like the set of all integers, or the set of all rational numbers. If we can show a similar relationship about their sizes, that they are both less than or equal to one another, can we conclude that they actually are the same size? At first, this may even seem like a silly question. Infinities are tricky. You may think, well, of course two infinite sets will be the same size. They're both infinite. But that actually turns out not to be true, and proving this seemingly simple statement will require a bit of work. The first part of that work will be to pin down exactly what we mean when we talk about infinite sets being larger, smaller, or the same size as one another. When we're dealing with finite sets of things, it's easy to determine when they're the same size. Just count the number of elements in each and see if you get the same number. But if a set is infinite, that means you can't just count the elements, so we need a better definition. Here's the idea. Another way to determine if two sets are the same size is if you can find a function that perfectly matches up the elements of one with the elements of another. Of course, if they're the same size, there are lots of ways to match up the different elements. In this diagram, it's possible to make sure that every element on the right has exactly one arrow going into it. If set B was bigger, then we'd necessarily have to miss out on some element. We couldn't possibly match them all. If set B was smaller, we'd still have to draw one arrow for each element of A, so we'd end up having at least two arrows going to the same place. But let's go back to our perfect matching, where sets A and B are the same size. This type of mapping is called a bijection. It officially means a map from A to B, where every element of A matches with exactly one element of B. If we can find a bijection between A and B, then we can say that they're the same size. That logic seems pretty obvious for finite sets, but it also applies equally well for infinite sets. For a classic example, think about, on one hand, the natural numbers, which we'll call n. They go off infinitely in one direction. On the other, think about the integers, which also include the negative numbers. We'll call that z, and it goes off infinitely in both directions. At first glance, it seems like these sets can't possibly be the same size. All the elements of n are contained in z, but on top of that, there are an infinite amount of extras left over. But just because one particular way of matching up the numbers doesn't give a bijection, that doesn't mean that there's no way to find a bijection. Instead, we can match them by alternating back and forth. Let's say 0 matches to 0, but 1 goes to negative 1. Next, we'll match 2 with positive 1, 3 will match to negative 2, and 4 will match to positive 2. Likewise, 5 matches to negative 3, and 6 matches to positive 3, and so on. In the end, all the even numbers on the left match up with all the positive numbers on the right. All the odd numbers on the left match up with all the negative numbers on the right. Another way to think about it is that as we move down the left side, we keep flipping from positive to negative on the right. In this process, Every integer will get hit exactly once. We'll never skip over any, and there will never be any duplicates. So, we have a bijection. And since we made the definition that two sets are the same size if there's a bijection between them, we have to conclude that n and z are in fact the same size. 
it's a little weird to wrap your head around if you've never seen it before. But that's par for the course with Infinity. You make definitions that seem perfectly obvious for finite things, but they often have unintuitive and interesting results when it comes to the infinite. Now, not every pair of infinite sets has a bijection between them. Consider R, the set of all real numbers, which includes fractions and infinite decimals. Just to be clear, I can't draw all the real numbers here, because there are an infinite amount even just between 0 and 1. You can find tons of great videos on YouTube that prove how you can't find a bijection between n and r. They may both be infinite, but one infinity is actually bigger than the other. If you'd like to learn more about that, I suggest you search up something like uncountability of the real numbers. But what we can say about n and r right now is that clearly the size of n must be less than or equal to the size of r. How do we know that? Well, going back to our pictures with the arrows, we can definitely write a function which maps every element of n to a different element of r. Of course, we're going to miss a huge amount of elements on the right, but the important fact here is that we never have to draw an arrow to the same place twice. The fact that we can draw a function that at least doesn't have any duplicates lets us write that the size of n is not equal, but less than or equal to that of r. It's nowhere near as strong as finding a bijection, but there's another name for this type of function, an injection. Officially, an injection from a to b is one where no two elements of a point to the same element of b. In other words, there could be no arrows going to some point on the right, or there could be one, but never more than that. This is how we'll officially define an infinite set being less than or equal to another in size, if there is an injection between them. This definition lets us finally go back to the question we posed at the very start of the video. If the size of a is less than or equal to the size of b, and the size of b is less than or equal to the size of a, can we say their sizes are the same? Let's translate this into the language of injections and bijections. What we're asking here is really, if there is an injection from a to b, and an injection from b to a, can we find a bijection between a and b? With this phrasing of the question, we start to see why this isn't as obvious as the original statement made it seem. Let's imagine a picture. We start with two infinite sets, and draw an injection from a to b. Imagine it keeps going in this pattern for every element of a, I just don't have the room to draw them all here. This injection is allowed to skip over some points in b. Likewise, the second injection, starting in b, probably misses a bunch of values in A. Somehow, we would need to combine the information from these two imperfect mappings to make a full-on perfect bijection. This isn't easy, but as it turns out, we can do it. This fact is known as the Cantor-Bernstein-Schroeder theorem, and next, we'll see exactly how to prove it. To begin with, Let's think about the possible patterns of arrows going in each direction. First, imagine there's some element in set A that doesn't have a blue arrow going into it. Then we can follow the yellow arrow going out of it over to set B. That element has a blue arrow going out of it, and that takes us back over to set A. My claim is that this process will go on forever. It'll never stop and it'll never loop back to an element we've already seen. Why not? Well, we'll definitely never run out of arrows. And to show that we'll never loop to something we've already included, consider what that would have to look like. There would need to be some element of A later on, which mapped to an element of B that was already in the chain. But that isn't possible, because the yellow arrows represent an injective function, 
and injective means that you never hit the same endpoint twice. We also assumed that the first node had no arrow going into it. So we have an infinite sequence of items bouncing back and forth between A and B. They don't cover all of A and B, but just for the elements in this chain, we can find a bijection matching them. How? Just take all the yellow arrows. We assumed that our first point didn't have a blue arrow going into it, so we'll cover every point in a chain like this by just taking the yellow ones. This will be the key idea for the rest of our proof. Figure out all the different kinds of chains that can show up, and find a way to turn each one individually into its own little bijection. So how else might the chains look? We might also imagine a chain that starts in B, because there may be some elements of B with no yellow arrows going to them. The exact same reasoning as before applies. We can keep following the arrows back and forth, and we'll get another unending chain. This time, however, if we take all the yellow arrows to make our bijection, that very first element on the right won't get matched with anything. Instead, we'll have to take all the blue arrows. That way, every single dot in the chain gets a partner. Next, we have to consider the chains that don't have starting points. In the first two cases, the idea that a chain couldn't loop back on itself depended on there being a starting point with no arrow going into it. But suppose we don't have a starting point. Then it is possible for a chain to be a loop. It might look something like this. Notice that every element in the chain still has exactly one arrow going out of it and exactly one arrow going into it. We haven't violated the conditions of our injections. In this case, we can match up the elements to form a bijection using either color of arrows, the yellow or the blue. Either works equally well, so let's arbitrarily choose the blue. Finally, we might find a chain that goes infinitely in both directions. No starting point, but also never looping back on itself. If that's the case, again, either the yellow or the blue arrows will work equally well to match up all the elements. Since the chain never stops in either direction, we'll never run into an odd one out scenario like we did in the first two cases. These are the four different ways a chain could show up. Either it starts in A, it starts in B, it's a loop with no start and end, or it goes infinitely in both directions. For different functions between A and B, it's possible that all of these happen in different parts of the picture. But the key point is that every element of A and B will belong to a chain that looks like one of these four. So, if we can build a bijection in each chain individually, we can put those together and finally make a bijection for all of A and B. This is our proof of the Cantor-Bernstein-Schroeder theorem. It took some work to get there, but starting with just two injections, we turned them into a bona fide bijection by separating out the sets and finding a bijection for each of these possible cycles. Before we finish up, let's take a look at one example of the Cantor-Bernstein-Schroeder theorem in action. Here's a cheeky little proof that I like, which shows that the set 1, 2, 3 of positive natural numbers is the same size as the set of all positive rational numbers, fractions greater than zero. To show this, we need injections going both ways. Going left to right is easy. Natural numbers are rational numbers, and we can just take n to the fraction n over 1. Clearly this map is injective, since no values of n will go to the same place. Getting an injective map going the other way is a bit trickier, 
but we can rely on prime numbers to get the job done. Let's send p over q to the number 2 to the p times 3 to the q. Because 2 and 3 don't share any factors, different values of p and q will always result in different numbers. And since the numerator and denominator are always positive, we'll also get a positive integer for 2 to the p, 3 to the q. After we have these two injective functions, Cantor Bernstein Schroeder lets us automatically conclude that these two infinite sets are the same size, even though we never wrote out an explicit bijection between them. If we wanted, we could look at the chains that might divide up the two sets. For example, one chain will start at 1. No fraction will map to 1, because that would be 2 to the 0 times 3 to the 0, and 0 over 0 isn't a valid fraction. But 1 will map to 1 over 1 on the right. That will map to 2 to the 1st times 3 to the 1st, which is 6, on the left. 6 matches to 6 over 1 on the right, and that'll go to 2 to the 6th times 3 on the left. This is a chain that'll keep going down, growing infinitely large. Since it starts on the left, when we make our bijection, we'll use the yellow arrows to match up its elements. On the other hand, we've also got some chains that start on the right. A fraction like 1 fourth will have no arrow going into it. It'll map to 2 to the 1st times 3 to the 4th, which is 162. That maps to 162 over 1, which maps to 2 to the 162 times 3 to the 1st, a number with over 100 digits. Since the chain starts on the right, we need to take the blue arrows in order to match up the items without leaving any out. In fact, every fraction which isn't just something over 1 will be the start of its own chain. You can also prove that there are no loops or two-way infinite chains in this example. But in the end, we can piece together these unrelated injections into a bijection between the two sets. Infinities are always tricky, and theorems like Cantor-Bernstein-Schroeder show us how careful we need to be with them. First and foremost, we need to pin down our definitions. If we didn't know what injections and bijections were, it would have been impossible to get anywhere. And second, we need to be willing to explore the consequences of those definitions, even if they lead us to results that are counterintuitive. I hope you enjoyed taking a brief dive into set theory today. Let me know if you would like to see more videos like this, or if there are other ideas you'd like me to cover. Thanks for watching.